Uh, and so before I introduce the panelists, let me try to motivate the problem, at least as I understand it, and hopefully that will uh, give us something to go on. I think that uh, especially at very top universities like Berkeley's, and we'll be talking about Berkeley's particular experiences uh, with, this, with this problem. Uh, at, at top universities like Berkeley, it has long been the case uh, that, that teaching graduate students how to teach was handled informally. Uh, sometimes through a kind of osmosis, it was just expected that if you hung around the place long enough, uh, you would come out with some idea of how to teach, mainly by serving as a teaching, teaching assistant. And it's very much an artisanal, apprentice-based, sort of guild craft knowledge uh, that, that had been the model. And often people uh, who've been trained in this model or who've experienced this model, come up through this model as apprentices themselves, are very resistant to other ways of thinking about how uh, pedagogy can be handled uh, in the graduate program. But there is, however, uh, there are many alternative approaches, uh, and one of which uh, emerges from the what's called the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, SOTL. I imagine many of you are familiar with that acronym already. Uh, and what SOTL tries to do is uh, apply research uh, and, and a sort of specialization in pedagogy to the problem of how to teach history. So rather than uh, historical teaching being handled by people who just think really hard about their topics and then have some sort of experiential uh, basis for, for uh, uh, holding forth on what the best way to teach it is, this is uh, a sort of specialized knowledge about how to teach coming from people whose primary or, uh, or at least large uh, engagement as scholars is in thinking about how to teach. Um, this is, I think, uh, a way of thinking about teaching that is becoming increasingly uh, compelling to us, partly because even at top programs like Berkeley, just because of the uh, economics of the job market, students who come up as apprentices uh, to sort of replace their professors are finding that they're not always able to quickly jump into jobs that are exactly like the ones that their professors have occupied. So they're finding themselves uh, thrust into all kinds of new educational settings uh, at different kinds of universities, dealing with different kinds of students, sometimes students with far greater needs. Uh, and they're finding that uh, when this happens, it's useful to be able to speak the language of subtle, if not the, as their primary uh, uh, language, at least something in which they are conversing. Uh, so there is still, I think this is, I don't want to say that as a kind of old way of doing things, new way of doing things story. I think there's still a lot of tension and some legitimate open <coughs> questions about how exactly uh, we should balance the sense of teaching as a craft knowledge and the artisanal craft knowledge versus teaching as something that we can study uh, uh, professionally with, with research techniques. And, and, and it's because I think that tension is a, is a real one that projects such as Berkeley's on how to deal with this, how to take a top university and really uh, take teaching seriously as the primary uh, thing of engagement is such an interesting and intellectually rich question rather than just a sort of technical one. Um, I'll also say that uh, the grant from the Teagle Foundation that Berkeley has to explore this through the process of a pedagogy seminar involves the AHA as a partner, and uh, Laura Westhoff will talk about that in a moment, uh, but that Northwestern University, where I'm based, uh, has a similar grant, and so we've gone through a very similar process. So uh, at the same time as, as Berkeley has been doing this, we've been watching them very eagerly and asking them a lot of highly specific questions about, about uh, what works and what doesn't. Um, and we have some people here from the Northwestern program, too, hopefully, who will get in the conversation. Okay, so uh, we have a lot of people on the dais, but uh, we will keep it relatively short uh, because we're looking forward to having uh, a good conversation with, with everyone uh, here in the audience. Uh, so first we will hear from uh, Laura Westhoff, who is an Associate Professor of History and Education at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Um, as a historical researcher, she specializes in U.S. progressive era history, uh, but her research interests are very much bound up uh, with her interest in pedagogy. Uh, then next up we'll have Lindsay Skiba, who's an advanced graduate student studying U.S. Latin American relations at UC Berkeley. Lindsay is the graduate convener of the Berkeley seminar that has been the focus of all this. Uh, the faculty convener is Daniel Sargent, who's sitting right here. Hopefully we'll be part of the conversation as well. We're also very lucky to have two actual participants in the uh, students in the, in the graduate seminar. So that's uh, Clara Leon, who studies uh, late modern Europe, uh, and then Haley Rucker, who studies early modern Europe, who will talk about what they're experiencing uh, at, from a student perspective. 
I'll also mention as one other person of interest, uh, Rebecca Marshall, who is the graduate convener of the seminar at Northwestern, so the Northwestern equivalent of Lindsay Skeen. Okay, so with that large test of character in your minds, uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to Laura. Thank you. So <laughs> There's too many of us back here. <laughs> get started with my uh, my comments on the, this process in which I was very fortunate to have been involved with. I'm, I'm curious who's in the room. How many of you are graduate directors or uh, have a course similar to this in your institution? And uh, faculty who might teach such a course? Okay. And graduate students? Okay, so we're fairly evenly divided, which I think is a, is portends well for our conversation. Um, my contribution to this panel is to report on the role of the AHA delegation to the planning session at Berkeley. Uh, I was one of a group of five. I, I want to mention the other participants, um, David Pace from the University of Indiana, Lendell Calder from Augustana College, Keith Erickson from the University of Texas in El Paso, and Sam Weinberg from Stanford. And I am from the University of Missouri in St. Louis, where I, my primary appointment is in history, and I also have uh, an appointment in the College of Education there. We were assembled by the AHA to meet with Berkeley faculty, graduate students, to discuss ideas for revising the History 300 course. And in that capacity, um, the collection of people I think is, is important and the AHA's role is important. First, um, the Teagle grant and the AHA's commitment to undergraduate education, undergraduate teaching, was first and foremost. And the, the Teagle's interest and the AHA support of really thinking about how we prepare people to teach undergraduates um, sat at the, at the heart of this. And all of us who uh, came to Berkeley uh, as delegates from the AHA were um, very much involved in undergraduate education. It's our primary uh, role in our institutions. And we represented a wide range of institutions where future faculty um, may well find themselves. So my institution, for example, is in St. Louis. It's an urban campus of the University of Missouri system. We have a number of uh, commuter students, a very non-traditional campus, um, ranging to uh, Lendl Calder's undergraduate liberal, liberal arts college. So really, we, we represent a variety of institutions. Um, in preparation for our meeting, we met by phone with Lindsay and by email and talked among ourselves what the goals were and tried to understand as best we could what Berkeley's goals were, which is we understood them were, was to prepare graduate students to be better teachers of undergraduate students, to help their students be better candidates on the job market, to prepare students to think reflectively about teaching, and to think about ways that this course could be a venue for um, creativity in, in the sessions, in the discussion sections. And this represented a shift, from what I understand, of this course, which is required by the University of California system of all graduate student instructors, GSIs, uh, which had certain sort of general teaching requirements to it. And the hope was that, that the course could more deeply reflect a historical pedagogy, a, an attempt to understand how we, better, how we can be better teachers of history. Or as uh, one, of the, um, one of my fellow um, panelists summed up, you know, how can I be a better scholarly teacher of history? And that was represented at our meetings in our two-day meeting in Berkeley last March around the questions of the scholarship of teaching and learning, what role might SOTO play in the design of the course, and 
as well to um, begin to think about how whether you're interested, whether a faculty member is interested in SOTL or not, how one's involvement or how one's commitment to teaching might be grounded in a research-based um, approach to teaching. So let me say a couple words about, about that. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this term or with this practice, um, this field, it's uh, a field that grows out of cognitive scientists, educational psychologists such as Sam Weinberg, who is also on our committee, um, that look at the distinct thinking practices that historians employ. So uh, over the past 25 years, uh, attention has gone into how do historians read? What kinds of things do they think about as they read texts, primary texts, secondary texts? What kinds of um, thinking processes do we go through when we make sense of that evidence? Uh, how do we help students develop these skills? What are the differences between the ways that historians think and your typical 18-year-old thinks? And that was the subject of a talk that Sam gave during those two days. Um, what's in the 18-year-old mind? And based on his research, he um, you know, really hammered home the point that for most of us, we do this work because it's something we enjoy, it's fairly intuitive to us, but not so for most of our students. And so the question then is, how might we use what we know about the gap between what historians do and how students think to help develop students' historical thinking skills? Um, so I, I think maybe I'll stop, um, I'll stop there with the final thoughts that, that we kind of left with, and we talked quite a bit about at Berkeley, and that is that we might think of this as a matter of, of social justice, of access for a number of students who come not well prepared to do the kinds of thinking that college asks of them. And my, my own goal or mission is to sort of shift what is often kind of the water cooler conversation about how our students can't do things they can't do things, they're not able to do what we're asking them, and how might we help them develop those skills so that they can do more of the kinds of deep thinking that we value so much in our profession. So um, based on this, on the research that, that many engaged in this um, field have done, there, we're beginning to know ways of how we can do that. So I will stop there, and um, we left Berkeley, and a course somehow magically appeared from my perspective. <laughs> I wanted to, to start by thanking Laura and the rest of the AHA delegation, as well as our history department, Daniel Sargent, the instructor of the course in particular for involving me in this project. Um, as Daniel Immerwehr mentioned, I'm an advanced graduate student. I'm a six-year student. I took the original course history 300 in my third semester, and at that time, it was more of uh, more focus on um, troubleshooting um, and sharing experience, as well as some observation of other graduate student teaching. That was really the main thrust. As Laura mentioned, uh, the AHA delegation came. This was in. March, uh, Daniel Sargent, Ethan Shagan, Maureen Miller, we were all part of this uh, conversation with the delegation that we were so grateful actually to Julia Brookins for, for organizing and, and bringing together. My role was uh, in the wake of the, uh, of the meetings uh, to work with Daniel Sargent to revise the course, revise the architecture of the course, which is to say the syllabus. So I'll talk a little bit about um, Berkeley and the institutional setting for this course revision, our objectives, uh, and the outcome, which is to say the syllabus, and then we'll move on to Clara and Haley to talk about how students experienced the new course on its first, uh, first uh, 
version, which is to say this past semesters. First, institutionally, as Laura mentioned as well, um, our graduate division of the university requires that every department provide a pedagogy course, a semester-long course, for first-time GSIs or graduate student instructors, teaching assistants at other schools. Um, and these, uh, these courses must be provided before or during that first semester of teaching. It's also true uh, at a university, the university level, that our graduate student instructors get a one-day required conference where they address some nuts and bolts teaching issues uh, across, across disciplines. In the history department, then, most of the students who are taking the pedagogy course are teaching for the first time, but not all of them that they are teaching. They're teaching as GSIs, which is to say that they're leading discussions, weekly discussions, often two hours, sometimes one hour. But they're also students who are grading for a course um, who are not yet teaching. Uh, our students um, who are generally in their third semester are also studying for their third semester exam. So they're taking the pedagogy course at a particularly demanding time in their graduate school careers. We wanted to construct a pedagogy course that would respond to our graduate students' needs at this very demanding time and to do two things, to hone excellence in teaching at Berkeley and beyond and to support our graduate students' professional development as teachers. In redesigning the syllabus, we try to achieve these goals um, really by sort of in three ways. One, uh, to have students apply some of these insights from SOTL, from other areas of pedagogical research. Two, to have students uh, be aware of the resources that are out there while they're at Berkeley and afterwards. So this could be SOTL, various online resources like History Matters and mm -hmm. that Laura pointed us to, uh, the community of scholars out there and just to have them have an acquaintance um, with that. And thirdly, to have students who are early in their uh, careers at Berkeley get to know the resources at Berkeley, which is to say faculty members, um, staff as well, and to learn from the experiences and approaches uh, there too. We split the course then into two halves, and both halves were driven by a big question, which was uh, and is what's the purpose of historical thinking, and relatedly, uh, what's the relationship between historical teaching and historical research? Mm -hmm. The first half of the course addresses some particular teaching challenges. The second half invites Berkeley faculty from the history department to join a broader conversation about undergraduate education in the work of teaching. The major written assignment for the course was a first draft of the Statement of Teaching Philosophy. And this was designed to be informed by this big picture discussion as well as students uh, work as teachers and if they're not teaching, learning from hearing from their colleagues who are teaching for the first time as GSIs and certainly to get students moving forward in that professional development as teachers. So I'll talk just a little bit more in detail about the first and second half of the course to give you a sense of what actually uh, was uh, created out of the AHA uh, meetings. I should note first that uh, Daniel and I also participated in a cross-disciplinary seminar at Berkeley uh, in which we joined with um, other pairs of professors and graduate students and read and talked about research on pedagogy, including for STEM disciplines, and we're trying to think of some uh, common and helpful insights from pedagogy research uh, more broadly. So the first half of the course, after going through some practical tips, the course was framed with some readings to get students to think about historical thinking. Laura mentioned uh, Sam Weinberg. Students read an excerpt from his historical thinking and other unnatural acts, as well as um, excerpts from William Sewell's Logics of History to get these big questions uh, out there at the outset. Then uh, the students addressed some of these um, issues in teaching, including how to work with students so that they can read more effectively, write more effectively, trying to understand how students learn in the first place. 
In the second half of the course, as I mentioned, history faculty from Berkeley was invited to join the conversation and enrich the conversation with their experiences. Some of the topics addressed there included lecturing and historical thinking, uh, professional development and university teaching, and the undergraduate curriculum, stepping back and getting a chance to think about what undergraduates are, are, are dealing with um, overall and how they're being asked to approach knowledge. Instead of assigning uh, large amounts of reading and doing extensive written assignments throughout the semester, we created activities that were designed to have students to approach what they were already doing to teach and to study, but to do it in different ways, really to try to have an approach teaching as researchers. And I think that was really a huge uh, takeaway from the meetings with the AHA delegation. So for example, in the week on discussion leading, students were asked to choose a discussion strategy um, that Peter Frederick describes in his short article, The Dreaded Discussion. Try it out in the classroom, assess the outcomes, talk about it. <coughs> or for example, in the week on lecturing, students were asked to um, in going to a lecture that they're attending either for the class they're teaching or in preparation for their third semester exam to go to that lecture and identify which historical skills and concepts the lecturer conveys and how she or he does that. In this year's course, discussion of readings was a major component of how the course actually uh, played out and did end up being a, a primary focus more than weekly assignments. So I'll turn over the floor then to, to Clara and Haley so they can talk about how that, how that went. I'm Clara Leon, one of the graduate students who is participating in this class. And um, so um, it was a very interesting and informative experience for me. Particularly, I had never taught before in anything resembling a university setting and tutored foreign language. But, um, and so I never really approached these big questions about teaching and related them to research. I had ideas about research topics and um, the things I want to do there, but I really hadn't asked, you know, early on in the class we had a, we had a discussion where uh, Professor Sargent asked us what, what's the goal of research and what's the goal of teaching and to come up with a short statement of what our role as teachers and researchers are and to problematize whether those roles are more similar than we might have imagined, which was really something of a revelation for me because I never realized that teaching was something that could be so personalizable. I um, I thought that basically you were handed a curriculum and you know, I assume that even even at the level of a professor, I assume that, you know, there's a certain number of courses that a university a history department has to teach and if you're a late modern European person, you're going to teach you up in the 20th century or something like that. But I didn't realize how much discretion we might have in coming up with courses and beyond that, um, teaching styles and the different things that would be generally in terms of um, teaching skills, teaching historical thinking, um, issues like that. So, um, yeah, and I feel like teaching it the first time as I was discussing these things in the classroom was really useful because I could see in a first-hand way, you know, the students, for instance, did not display the kind of historical thinking that was pretty natural for me. And so trying to ask how I can um, make this clearer to them, how, whether it's by modeling or some other thing, um, to get them to do that. Um, one other part of our class wound up being a lot on um, professional development and um, a lot of a lot of things that serve the purpose of 
showing us, for instance, um, we had um, Rachel Reinhardt come in and talk about a new um, California um, initiative for um, K-12 education and changing curriculum. So a lot of that was about um, how, how the students that we are now teaching have been prepared. But it was also really useful to learn about that, to learn about other options for people who've been through um, PhD programs to um, what, other, what other types of options are there out there for our, um, our own work later on. So um, I think that a lot of graduate students have assumptions about how how this process is supposed to work, how um, one is supposed to go through grad school and to ideally apply for a tenure track position and if you don't get that, then what? But in fact, there's a lot of people with a lot of other um, jobs out there, a lot of other potential paths. And um, so I feel like um, in a future version of the class, it might be useful to unpack these assumptions the same way that we unpack assumptions about um, teaching and researching. That's to say, asking the class like, what we, um, what we, what are our expectations when we finish, and um, to look at the statistics and maybe, you know, have more people come in with different career paths to talk about that path. Um, yeah. So I felt, you know, as a second year graduate student some of these specific um, exercises that we went through, I've never thought about them before, and I'm just beginning to start, start to think about them now. <coughs> but at the same time, I think it was really useful to have this, begin this discussion early like this. And I think I would recommend to um, future participants to maybe take it in their first year, because then it would be thinking about um, teaching as part of research and as part of their um, graduate school and professional training track from the beginning and maybe that might solve the problem of um, doing it in the third semester as so. well. So, hello. So I'm Haley. I'm also a second year graduate student at UC Berkeley. Um, this is also my first semester teaching, um, although I did do one TA position at the University of Arizona while I was there. Um, so I came to Berkeley expecting to teach, excited about teaching, um, but I still found this course to be really helpful. Um, okay, so yeah, so the big thing that we talked about in this course were these big questions about what is history, what we're aiming to do as historians um, in our research and also in our teaching. Um, this was the most important thing to me from the class uh, as a takeaway. And I think it was really useful um, to talk about these big questions so early in our career in terms of formulating our own approaches as historians and as teachers going forward. From these conversations, it seemed like much of a class uh, we came together around the conclusion that we don't really see our work in the classroom as completely divided from our work as researchers, and there are a lot of ways in which we could bring these together and, and find both kinds of work to be really fruitful and creative intellectual endeavors. I think the faculty panels are especially useful for this. Um, we heard from, I think, something like 12 faculty um, all together talking about how they approach teaching, how they approach their work in the university, and how they see their teaching as related to the research that they do. One thing that came up repeatedly was that um, their work as lecturers, their work trying to relate to students, reflected back on their own research, on the current questions of the field, but also informed how they could uh, restructure their research to answer current questions in the public, um, making things maybe more relevant, more current, I don't know, but it seemed like a, a useful endeavor. The second big question that we talked about, I guess, is, is the primary question of how to instruct graduate students as teachers. Um, and most of this was conducted in a large discussion setting and around core readings as well as personal experiences, bridging the gap between the two. 
I think the conversations went well in terms of um, moving smoothly between these big questions of what history is and what we were actually doing each week in the classroom. I found that some students in their third semester were looking for more practical day-to-day -day support. And so there may be ways in which we could tie this together more. The readings did provide some, some support there, the, um, the dreaded discussion and some of the other readings that provide practical strategies for use in the classroom and the activities around those were useful. Uh, finally, we talked a lot about professional development and the different careers that come out of a history PhD program. And um, as Clara mentioned, one of the people who came in um, has received her PhD from Berkeley, went on to an academic career, and um, chose to follow a different path, one in which she's working now to link up Berkeley professors with secondary school teachers and creating creative curriculum from that. Uh, that was a, a particularly instructive um, moment for me to see what other people do with their careers. And um, I think we all agree that seeing more of a variety of professions that people come to after a PhD program can be really, really instructive. Um, finally, I think hearing from more of these people who go on to different careers could help us answer the question more thoroughly of what we do as historians, who we are as a community of historians, and what our goals are. And I think kind of bringing these questions up early and, and trying to address them in an academic setting was, was very fruitful. Hopefully you can help us on our way in our professional careers. So yeah, the class as a whole was productive, I think particularly around these bigger issues. So great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We'll have some final reflections from Laura before we open it up to a larger discussion. So I'm back to talk about my thoughts after um, we left Berkeley. And it's really wonderful to hear um, how some of my thoughts made it into the course. So <laughs> um, that's really good. Um, and maybe to segue into our discussion to open up some, some questions or issues that were kind of left hanging at the end of, uh, of our meeting time. Um, one of the, the challenges to the group that came up, and, and I think it's a, it's a good challenge and it's an important challenge for us to, um, to take up as a profession, is um, some of the things that we talk about in teaching generally or teaching history specifically, um, aren't they common sense? You know, do we need a research base around what we know is good teaching? And that's a question I think that is on the table for all disciplines, and certainly one that I've had to grapple with sitting in a College of Arts and Sciences and a College of Education. Um, I loved thinking quite a bit about that, and you know, sort of came to the conclusion that really my answer is yes and no. Um, I personally kind of walk a line between thinking that there is an art to teaching that is very hard to capture and that grows and develops over a career of doing it. Um, I also, though, know that students really do think differently from me and it's taken me maybe for the first decade of my career to really accept that, <laughs> that um, not everybody thinks like I do. And the more that I can understand about differences the way, in the way that my students think, um, the better I can challenge myself to teach them. Um, so I, I would love to hear more thoughts on that. Um, my second conclusion, though, that um, there is a, maybe a, a need for this kind of of literature and a push for us individually as teachers to know it's available, to call on it when we need to, is to build that culture of excellence around teaching, which I noticed um, framed your, your class. And I think this is a key. No matter how we do it in our individual classes, at our institutions, it's really framing and fostering a mindset early on in graduate programs that um, we can be excellent teachers and that that is worthy of our time. 
tenure doesn't necessarily support that at many places. It, it, some certainly it does, not at all at, at my institution. You know, my, my promotion is based on my research. Um, I'm committed to teaching, though, because I think it's, a, it's part of what I do as a citizen. It's part of what drives me personally. So I found in this sort of a, a quest to marry what history is as a career with some of what I value um, more holistically in my life. And I, I think all graduate students will wrestle with that as they move into their careers, is how does this make sense with who I am? How does what I do make sense? And um, encouraging that, that sort of sense of excellence that we foster around research is um, important for teaching as well. And it's especially important, if not personally, I think at this particular moment in time, it's important for the times in which we live and the attacks on history and humanities. And so I was really thrilled to hear that that was part, this was a broader part of your course, a broader conversation about what is the role of undergraduate education? What, what do we do in general education courses? Or how does history fit into a broader education of students? I think that is something that as a profession we're wrestling with right now. And certainly we see this coming out of AHA uh, statements and, and writings. And it's something that I hope we all get better at talking about. Because at least at institutions like mine, where humanities are, are subtly under attack and losing tenure track lines, losing funding for research. Uh, there's a, a culture working against us, and we're the only ones who can really speak forcefully um, to stem that. Um, finally, um, this issue of practical supports and, and teaching tips and this, this need, um, that was something that actually was a conversation apart from the, I, I think we talked about it some while we were there, but it, it's something that the panel talked a lot about over lunch and, and breakfast and so on. Um, you know, the, the need to find a way to make accessible what the scholarship of teaching and learning in history has taught us. Um, not everyone will necessarily be motivated to read through the literature, the research base, but is there a way to make its findings um, more accessible to students, to new faculty, to faculty who are trying to retool a particular thing that they do in the classroom? Um, you know, I, I think with the opportunities that, that the digital world offers us, with a growing community of scholars interested in this, I, I think that's something, and particularly as graduate programs attend more to this issue, that's something that um, we could look at as a community and, and find ways to sort of bring some of this wisdom practically to bear. Um, at the moment in which you most need it, which is like tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. So, thank you. Questions, but I think that what would be more interesting, since we have a lot of people in the room who have different but engaged experiences with this kind of thing, would be to open it up uh, to the audience with an understanding that this is not going to function exactly like a normal panel in the sense of people ask questions and people up here clarify, you know, clarify, oh, you were confused about this, let me explain it a little better. Um, but then we, then we're actually hoping to have a discussion uh, uh, with, with the entire room. Um, and the only thing I'll ask is that the, uh, when the panelists are speaking, if you could speak into the microphone, that will help the recording of this session. Yeah. Um, so any, any initial thoughts, comments, questions? Yeah, and could you identify yourself as well? I'm at the George Washington University. I'm also the director of graduate studies there. So this is a question that's interested me a great deal. And I have similar experiences to yours, which is this idea that basically an apprenticeship you learn by doing. So I have my own problems with that, largely having to do with we expect it to be an apprenticeship, but there's no supervision of the apprenticeship. It's like thrown into the classroom, they're supposed to absorb teaching, but there's no one supervising them, including the professor who might occasionally drift in 
once a semester. So that, that's one thing. But the, I have a lot of points, but I'm just going to bring up one right now. One is that this question of historical thinking, which is, I know, very in vogue, and we have a course similar to the one you described, and we read some of this material, like Sam Weinberg, some of the other material. So my question has to do with, uh, it's fascinating material, I think it's really interesting to think about, but the problem I have has to do with the types of courses we teach in the history program. So we have these big lecture classes that are intro classes. A lot of the students who come to those classes aren't going to be historians. They're not going to go on to even necessarily be history majors, right? So most of them want to know stuff about the past, right? They want a narrative about, that's interesting. That's what they want. They're, if we spend a lot of time getting them to think like a historian, my suspicion is we get really bad reviews from those students. It's very different, though, from the upper level classes where you get history majors, where they, that seems to be much more relevant. If you're going to be a history major, you better learn how to think like a historian. So I'm just wondering about that seems to be the real core of what's going on, is this thinking like a historian. But I'm wondering whether we need to question what goes on in different classes and what's appropriate for different venues. Um, so that's just a, a topic that's been sort of left I should say uh, uh, earlier, sooner rather than later, that I mean, one question that we talked about in preparing for this panel was um, a sort of when question. So when do we present to graduate students what? You know, when do we present the basic nuts and bolts of running a discussion section? When do we present these questions, these bigger questions about the purpose of studying history? Um, and I wonder if that's somewhat related to your question in terms of, um, you know, in thinking about uh, the different venues, the different kinds of classes that are being taught, the different kinds of undergrads who are coming, is this, are these questions that should be raised, for example, to first year graduate students to be thinking about this? For our purpose, these are first time teachers, sort of um, adding to the conversation this idea of when and in what format these kinds of questions should be raised or workshops that the entire department are a part of? Or is this something you think that for a pedagogy course, for first time teachers, um, those issues that you raise should be incorporated somehow? And do you have ideas yeah, I mean, I think for that? One of the tasks we have as historians is to get students beyond that, I'm going to sit in on a narrative history class that's going to be full of information, to hit them over the head with what history really is, which is interpretation and analysis. And they come in with one expectation. Isn't it our responsibility as teachers to help them change their perception? Which, if that means every single class, we tell them history is the interpretation of facts, not the, the, the facts themselves. It has to be the skill of reading documents at whatever level. Um, and, and, you know, it's the same thing with the, the graduate class. People come in and say, okay, so how do I run a good dis discussion or how do I give a good lecture? When, in fact, if you don't know what your student body is going to be like, uh, what your student expectations are going to be like, what is the difference between novice learning and expertise, all of that other stuff is, is it's superficial. And there's got to be that deeper change that, that goes on. And that's a lot harder. That's what is, I think, the work of the semester. Uh, and then the other stuff comes actually fairly easy in relation. Once you, you cause that, it's like looking at those optical illusions, you know, the, two, the chalice that turns into two faces or, or whatever. You're looking at things fun, in a fundamentally different way. I, I, to some extent, I, I'm beginning to think that this term, thinking like a historian, um, actually harms us some for the reasons you say. Um, I think that when I read deeply into the literature on this, what really comes through is that these are skills that historians are good at, but they're skills that all citizens, dare I say, should have um, or would benefit from. So careful attention to the source of a document, the source of what we're reading, the context in which it's written, those kinds of 
reading skills are, they're critical for doing what we do in the discipline, but they're also very valuable skills beyond the history classroom. And so I've heard this question posed from a lot of different venues, from, from K-12 teachers to, to graduate um, instructors, and I, you know, I, I wonder if some of the issue doesn't lie in, in sort of limiting it too much. While these are things that historians do, they are valuable for those beyond. Just to make a quick intervention, it's not really on the basis of my experience teaching this class, but that it occurs to me now. It might be useful in thinking about the purposes of undergraduate history education to make a distinction between teaching students to be good consumers of history and teaching students to be good producers of history mm -hmm. or rather mm -hmm. historiography. Mm -hmm. Because those are distinctive goals and in history departments we try to inform both of them. We're not always clear uh, with ourselves about the distinctions uh, between the two. Mm -hmm. I would just add to this, what sort of reiterating what others have said, um, that these are important things for historians to think through and to do intentionally. But I would also say that um, in terms of the broader community of historians, the ability to point to skills and understanding as outcomes of historical study, as opposed to mere content familiarity or the, the joy, the passion, of learning about the past. Uh, those are things that can really support history programs and history education more generally. We can say, well, the students aren't just learning about medieval monks. They're learning about how to interpret documents. They're learning about how to synthesize information. So in that sense, um, I would caution against well, they'd like it better if they were just learning about medieval monks. But the number of students also, I think, who would enjoy the, the pure love of the past versus the number of students who really need to know how to do stuff. Um, we'd be a much smaller community if we opened that, uh, the, the form of that, the letter as well. Can I go right back? Yeah, so I just want to say, too, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, this, the, I actually really appreciate what you're saying, right? I mean, I. Um, uh, and I do think there are reforms that need to be more near to heavy. I think that the, the, the question for everyone is not, um, uh, narrative is not opposed to historical thinking at all. I mean, it's, it's completely necessary, right? I mean, you have to have it. And, and, and I feel like the conversation right now, it almost it feels mm -hmm. like, are we going to do this or are we going to do that? Right? Mm -hmm. But you need narrative to do historical thinking, and you need historical thinking to have narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, yeah, some classes are going to be more narrative heavy, and I don't think we should that or shame that, I don't think that's something we should shy away from. Um, but that's, it's not an either or kind of proposition, right? It's not we're going to do more or the other. You have to have rules. You have to know, um, or, 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 you, or we're going to fail, right? Um, I really got this from, excuse me, an interesting place. I, I'm at Carnegie Mellon University. And so thinking like a historian is almost not an option for me when I teach. <laughs> because I'm dealing with STEM students all day long. And they're brilliant, and they want to learn how to approach it, but they have no basis to even start with. So I find myself having to think like a mathematician <laughs> instead of thinking like a historian to even frame it in a way that makes sense to them as a jumping off point to then get into thinking like a historian. So I think all of these things are good things, but I wonder in teaching graduate students how to approach teaching um, well, miniature background, I was kind of in your position at my school. We have a very, we have a half semester course on graduate teaching, but then I was the head TA for two years. So I worked with my colleagues to develop their teaching on a peer-to-peer -peer sort of basis. But trying to work with them on how to sort of get outside of their own head and reframe the discussion in a way that was more approachable to students that weren't getting it was sort of the hardest piece of what we had to do, but I feel like it was so useful because now that they've gone on and are you know, trying to find tenure track jobs and things, they're working in 
rural schools where the students aren't coming with the skills that they were accustomed to at a fairly elite technical school. They're working at liberal arts colleges where they're coming from a totally different framework. So learning to read the frame of who you're teaching, I think, is a very useful piece that I'm not sure is part of this discussion as much as I think that speaks to a little bit. Um, I'd like to both remind uh, interlocutors to feel invited to introduce themselves uh, before they speak, but also uh, to to respond a little bit to that. I I think that's right. I think that thus far in the room, we've had the sense that it would be good for the students to think more like us, that that's the goal, that they should think more like historians, whether we call it that or whether we just think of the way that we think as being a sort of vital component of citizenship, uh, that that's what we want to do. And I would just like to interject that it's not clear to me that the skills that we have as historians are all the things that we want to impart to our students. I think there are some things that we do uh, that are very valuable, but I think that it can be a little easy for us just to assume that the way that we think about the world is a kind of particularly useful way and that all the things that we do, including things that are fairly esoteric and specialized and really aren't going to be relevant to a lot of our students, uh, I think, I think we have to remember that, not, that the overwhelming majority of our students won't go to graduate school in history, shouldn't go to graduate school in history. Uh, and, and I think it's still a bit of the kind of old model where you just, the best students are the ones who are the most eligible for graduate school history. And, and the whole thing becomes sort of vocational school for being a historian. Um, I think there's going to be, it might help us to differentiate things that are useful for the vocation of the historian that we really care about. When we're talking to graduate students, that's where we're going to get into it. Uh, but with undergraduates, we might, we might want to distinguish things that are not really for them, not really as interesting for them or as useful for them. Um, so I'd like to put that out there as a possibility. But we had some more hands, uh, I see, yeah, in the back. I'm Mary Ellen Davis. I'm the executive director of the Association of College and Research Libraries. So not, a, not a historian, but I was intrigued by this um, panel because one of our strategic goals try and work with graduate students and help them teach because we're committed to the tools and the skills as well are talking about the critical thinking and the evaluation of information and the analysis of it so they can produce their own information. So I'd just like to make a plug for partnering with your academic librarian or getting your graduate students that are learning to be teachers connected to the academic librarian so they can be really helpful in, in working with those students so that they're you know, the it's a gentleman up front, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Justin Wolf I'm at Tulane University, and I'm the director of graduate studies there. And I guess I have a kind of a, a nuts and boltsy practical question, which is um, we have a diversity of faculty in terms of their approaches to teaching um, and their relationships to graduate students and graduate education, mm -hmm. from very hands on, very hands off, um, people who have what we might call very old fashioned. Uh, approaches to teaching to those who are constantly at the kind of teaching excellence center trying new things and, um, and so um, in many ways I, I feel like I've heard kind of student classroom uh, in the discussion and I'm thinking more practically about um, uh, a program and, and, mm -hmm. and the both difficulties but maybe successes people have had in managing the, that kind of complexity of a, of a department in trying to institute right, these kinds of really significant changes. I'd like to say, so the, the Northwestern program is different from the Berkeley program in one, to me, strikingly significant aspect is that whereas Berkeley runs a class, what uh, Rebecca and I did at Northwestern is we organized a series of workshops. Uh, so we had a core constituency that received some money from the Teagle Foundation to kind of keep them coming. But the effect of that was that anyone could come in to the workshops. And to our surprise, a lot of the faculty did. And to our joy, it turns out that they have, just as you said, remarkably diverse views about what is the point of teaching history, how to do it. And that, I think, has been, for me, the most interesting part of it was um, if it had been a classroom, we might have read some different viewpoints, and you know, I might have expressed mine a little bit. Uh, but, but, but what they, what I got to see, and what the students got to see, was was the gladiators' fight. Uh, was people that they knew, presumably had some modicum of respect for, understood where these people were coming from, 
and just seeing them kind of like <laughs> do, do battle with each other over some of the most fundamental things, which I thought about, we don't often talk about. So I mean, I was surprised to see some of my colleagues, you know, one person would say, well, I think that the point of doing history is to deconstruct received truths. And therefore, this is what I do in the classroom. Someone said, you do? <laughs> really? That's not what I do at all. <laughs> in fact, you know, I'm kind of offended that, that that's what you see, see as, as doing history. So that, I thought that was really cool. But it sounds like Rebecca has something to say about that. Yeah, and I would add to that, as we design a program also, we assume that there was going to be tension, right, different approaches. And also part of the grant was we're supposed to introduce evidence-based teaching to graduate students. So there was a premium on the solo literature. But we, uh, we, we set it up in a way that was like, we're going to introduce this sort of literature, but all, all viewpoints are welcome. And we were hoping that the areas of, of tension would be fruitful places for discussion and debate. And what we found also is that where there is disagreement, people often have a because about why they do what they do. So just getting different faculty members to articulate you know, it, the, these things haven't like fallen out of the sky. Like there are reasons why they continue to, you know, continue to lecture in a certain way. So, um, just having those um, those becauses explicit and on the table has been, I think, really enriching for department culture and for um, best practices in teaching. What were the topics of your workshop? We're still doing them right now, but um, <laughs> but we so we started with. Um, like histor it was um, getting on the same page about you know what historians say about history was the, the first workshop. So we read um, Sewell and also a book proposal from uh, one of our faculty members. And then we did um, what do we expect our students to do? So trying to uh, distinguish between what's inside baseball for us and what's maybe transferable for our students. And then the third one was um, what do students think we're doing? So that was where we did some uh, clueless and academia kind of stuff. But moving forward, we're going to spend the winter on course design. So that's where a lot of the social stuff will really come into play. Um, and a lot of workshops, too, with um, different faculty members coming to talk about why they lecture the way they do. And that kind of thing. Um, Julia Brookins, and then the person right next to you. I had a, a question for Lindsay about, and, and Daniel about the course design. Um, and in your remarks also remind me that um, you said you had 12 <coughs> Berkeley faculty members speak to the students in the course. I think approximately. And, and, I, and, and I see the value of that for the department culture and things. But I was also wondering, given the really extreme range of faculty careers in different institutional settings and being in the Bay Area, was there a reason you chose not to have faculty from other institutions speak to students? That's a great question. I, I certainly want to turn it over to Daniel Sargent <laughs> to, to think. <laughs> not, not, um, but certainly one thing that we were thinking about was um, the fact that these students uh, in our program are in their third semester, maybe even the, their first semester. Uh, they're new to, uh, to the institution relatively. So, and it they don't yet know the wealth of teaching backgrounds available to them right around them, people they might be working with, um, people they can turn to while at Berkeley. And this goes, I think, to my earlier point, too, about sort of when we do what we do um, and trying in our framework of a, a one-semester course for first-time teachers, sort of can we do all of those things or is there a way we can bring in insights from other faculty from other institutions in some sort of uh, workshop for advanced graduate students. Um, but that was definitely one of the goals, was thinking about where our students are at when they take this course. And again, they're, they're new and haven't yet had that exposure to a lot of faculty. And so we thought this would be a great way for them to start to tap into that. Ms. Julia, you know, Pastor there, I have a question on We thought that Various kinds of uh, teaching expertise were represented by the people on our faculty. Uh, although Berkeley is a particular kind of institution, uh, many of the faculty participants in the discussions that we had uh, brought with them experiences from quite different kinds of institutions. So I felt that that uh, you know, covered that, that particular uh, base. I suppose I, I, I could say a you know, few things um, more broadly about the uh, circumstance uh, in which uh, our class uh, was, was taught. 
and the constraints, because I think that those are important, uh, and I think that they are, are relevant uh, to other departments, particularly to directors of graduate studies who might be sort of contemplating uh, the uh, possible uh, utilities of a similar class uh, at their institutions. Uh, the first thing uh, to note about Berkeley's uh, class, our, our pedagogy seminar, and here I just want to underscore uh, the distinction which Daniel Armagar has, has already made with Northwestern's uh, seminar, is that our uh, pedagogy seminar is required and mandated by the university. Uh, graduate division, graduate in Berkeley, Argo, uh, mandates that all first-time graduate student instructors, uh, TAs, uh, take a pedagogy seminar during their first semester teaching at Berkeley. Uh, and this is helpful and it's also unhelpful. It's unhelpful um, because uh, the first semester uh, in a GSI's career is not necessarily the point in that GSI's career when the GSI is most uh, ready uh, to engage uh, with a you know, the kind of substantive, uh, even constructive uh, advice that uh, he or she might take from the literature. literature. You know, they're just figuring out how to do this for the first time. It's difficult. Um, Another uh, you know, structural uh, constraint that I think uh, you know, bears uh, some reflection uh, involves the predicament of the course instructor in a course of this nature. Right? Because ultimately, uh, the faculty member who is responsible for graduate student teaching in any given large lecture class is the faculty member who is teaching that particular lecture class. Uh, the uh, course instructor in a pedagogy seminar like this exists in a very peculiar relationship to graduate student teaching. Uh, because they're teaching the graduate students, but the graduate students they're teaching are actually teaching somebody else. So you're in a position of sort of trying to intervene uh, in classes that your colleagues are teaching, and you <laughs> necessarily do so with some trepidation, particularly if you happen to be an untenured junior faculty. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's an awkward uh, predicament. Uh, and my response uh, to, to the predicament, I think, was, was to try to do uh, something which is you know, actually more analogous uh, to what Daniel Amavar has, has tried to do at Northwestern than the uh, structural differences between our situations might, might suggest. Uh, we tried to take this class and to use it as a sort of vehicle uh, for uh, cultivating a broader department about graduate student teaching, about pedagogy. In retrospect, uh, you, you know, I, I sort of regret that this conversation had to proceed within the vehicle of the mandatory uh, graduate seminar. I would have preferred that we could have opened up this conversation to more advanced graduate students who would have brought in a different range of perspectives. Mm -hmm. I think the thing probably would have worked better as an optional uh, seminar. So, you know, if I had, you know, my druthers, I would fulfill the mandatory requirement in, in a different way, uh, you know, it's something much, uh, much abbreviated uh, from, from this uh, semester long course, and devote an entire semester long or two semester long uh, course uh, of seminar conversations, uh, you know, the kind of rich, diverse, interesting topics that we were able to engage uh, and which uh, our colleagues at Northwestern are also uh, in, in engaging uh, in, in the scholarship and practice of uh, history teaching. Um. My name is Kendra Fenna, and I just finished my PhD at Stanford, and now I happen to be working there in the Dean's office, where I work on projects concerning humanities, undergrads, and grads. And one of the things that we're, you know, like Berkeley uh, and Northwestern, struggling with is helping our grad students um, uh, enter successfully into a variety of teaching careers. Uh, and so at Stanford, one of the things that uh, we see that sort of is not working very well is that most of the training in pedagogy um, is either offered very much on an ad hoc basis inside the department um, or more formally through the Center for Teaching and Learning and that occurs at the whole sort of level of either the entire university um, or all the humanities departments. Uh, so students seem to lose interest when it's no longer just their discipline, right? So that's the great advantage of this. And I apologize, I missed the very beginning of this, so I hope I'm not repeating. But I'm wondering, because from an administrative standpoint, uh, you definitely see, well, we don't want to have, you know, repeat uh, courses of the same thing that are taking up valuable faculty time in every department if there's some way that we can bring students in English and history and French and Italian and philosophy together to learn um, what, you know, the sort of issues and approaches to teaching that they have in common. 
And so I wonder if there are suggestions in the room for at what point uh, it makes sense to bring people together and at what point um, these conversations uh, and practicums need to be discipline specific. I have one thought about that. Um, we've done a discipline specific model and I am a convert to that for two reasons. One is, they're, they're related. Um, one is that it's, we don't want to communicate the message to students that teaching is just something that happens on the side, right? And that's often the message that is de facto communicated, and it's not one that we want to, but you know. Uh, and so there's some level of seriousness, of institutional seriousness that is conveyed by faculty members in this department <laughs> people who you know uh, are teaching this class and are watching to see if you're in the class and are paying attention to you in the class. Secondly, um, I think ideally, uh, this isn't about the inculcation of best practices. This is about getting students to recognize uh, the relationship between their particular vision of historical thinking that emanates from their historical research and then attaching it to a teaching program. I think if they can make that connection, their teaching is going to be a lot better. They're going to be a lot better at talking about their teaching uh, when they're applying for jobs. Uh, and then also teaching is going to seem like not something you do on the side, but part of something that you're doing as you're being formed as a historian, right? That the teaching and research are actually related. This is something that Clara mentioned, but as the force of it has been striking me sort of repeatedly over the course of, of this experiment. So um, that's not to say that there aren't allied disciplines, and we've been in conversation with some at Northwestern, but um, I've really felt like it's important that it be historians who are doing this. Yeah, just in response to that, I mean, at George Washington University, we do have both, so we have an in department part, and then there's also and they've just, which is very brief and half it's online, and I think the students find it pretty worthless. But then there's a new program that's been developed out of our equivalent of teaching and learning, um, which is, um, it's about developing professional skills for academics. And so it, it covers things like teaching skills. Um, and it's for students later in their career, so not second year, but maybe their fifth or sixth year when they're about to go out on the job market. And I've heard really very positive feedback from students who have gone through that program and have signed up for it and be admitted to it. Um, but the one thing that I am thinking in response to your remarks just now is I appreciate the, this concept that teaching should come out of one's own research and therefore having it sort of generically applied across departments doesn't really capture that. But at the same time, just at the practical level, there are things that other people who may not be historians know about things about teaching that if we just talk among ourselves, it may not come up. And sometimes, you know, you get it from a poetry teacher, or you might get it from, you might even get it from a physics teacher. You know, there are techniques, and they're not historically specific, but they can be really eye-opening because I think, you know, one of our goals is to try to capture students' interest. Um, and sometimes we're not very good at it. I don't think historians are particularly gifted at engaging students. Some of them are because they're particularly dynamic personalities, but I don't think that the historical way of thinking is, is, as you said earlier, naturally conducive to capturing students' imaginations. And we're all struggling with declining enrollments. And so I do think we have to be a little more imaginative about the kinds of techniques that are used in classrooms. Uh, Rachel Gross, I'm a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where we're considering implementing a teaching course as well. Um, one of the things I haven't heard us talk about a lot is the classroom space itself, where the undergraduates are, which seems to have been maintained as a kind of sacred space away from the discussions about teaching between graduate students and undergrads, graduate students and professors. So I'm wondering, from the schools that are represented in here, what kinds of in-classroom observations are happening both from professors who mentioned might drop in once or twice during the semester from peer graduate students both formally and informally and how to set standards for what kinds of observation that looks like in order to build on the culture of excellence that clearly these classes and workshops are working towards. Okay. Well, let me just respond quickly. That, that's a really terrific question. It's a very, very difficult question. Uh, I felt teaching the pedagogy seminar Berkeley uh, that this previous fall but my position was somewhat analogous to that of a writing tutor who never got to see the writing that the students produced. I had to listen to the students describe their writing, describe the problems that they were having with their writing, but I never actually got to see it. 
And that's a very difficult predicament to be in as a teacher of graduate students. I don't have any solution to it. And I think the fact that you're looking for solutions to it is, is very possible. So, um, I'll find it. Okay. So I know at Berkeley we can choose to have, I think, the Center for Teaching and Learning observe us and videotape our discussion sections, but I actually don't know many people who've done that yet. Um, and as for my semester, I didn't have a professor come, the professor didn't have time to come and ob observe my discussion section, which I think is probably a common predicament. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah. So, I was, my professor came in and observed me, and I later learned that he is one of the few professors who came in, who comes in and systematically observes his um, graduate students. And um, I, I got a lot of very useful and sort of nuts and bolts type information from him. Um, he walked us through his lectures. We talked about, as a group with the head, GSI, what the salient points were, what we should be discussing with the students. We would run by the ideas um, that we had for how to manage the classroom, how to present each each topic. But I don't think that this was a general experience of most um, most of the impression I got was that our um, our professor was very hands on in a way that many professors aren't. Um, I think I agree. It would be interesting to talk about the classroom space and um, how that works. And I mean, I, I had the experience of very nuts and bolts here of two very different differently organized classrooms. One that was a large classroom with like rolly chairs and the students could screw around and um, it was very easy to get them to do group work or uh, change their position. And another classroom with a big seminar table and not much room to walk around and so um, we, didn't, we never discussed this even either in pedagogy or um, really with the professor but um, there were a lot of things on the ground that I was thinking about okay I want them to do group work and it works this way in the one classroom, can I do that in the other classroom? And um, thinking about physical space is really important. Okay. And, and to follow up on the um, observations, I think in our program, we have is it seven graduate students? There are some graduate students who are getting observed by the Teaching and Learning Center before, before the program, like before the legal series, and then they're going to be observed again later. So, so there are these external evaluators who are going to track how they're teaching this time. That's right, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that there are lots of ways to address this depending on how uh, how much time and how serious the students are that, that want input. Um, certainly, we um, all new teachers are really anxious, all older teachers are anxious about having people come in and, and watch their teaching. And I, I think fostering from the beginning that maybe you have a partner, you have a peer who is supporting you can help break some of that down. Um, in looking maybe at topical issues that, that you're trying to address, whether it's the dreaded discussion, whatever. Um, you know, you can use a phone to sort of tape some of what what you're doing in the classroom and, and bring that into discussion and, and say, you know, I, here I was trying to do this. Um, where did that succeed? Where did that break down? You know, some, and then you get to some of the dynamics. You know, that's a different kind of practical um, involvement in one's teaching than we're, we usually think about, but I, I think that there are ways to address it, and it's certainly sort of building this culture around supporting each other in teaching is, I think supporting is the key word, um, because this idea of someone's coming in to observe you and, and give you feedback can be helpful, but across the course of our career at some point, you know, that's, that's not necessarily what we're looking for, but, and, and can make us uncomfortable. But if early on we think about teaching as something that we support each other as doing, like building a departmental culture around teaching, um, I think that 
is that would be valuable. It's it's something that I can do with some colleagues, but certainly not others. I'd just like to give some specific uh, context uh, to the diversion experiences uh, that Clara and Bailey uh, reported on uh, this, this semester. At Berkeley, uh, in our undergraduate curriculum, uh, we make a very uh, firm distinction between lower division and upper division undergraduate classes. And uh, within the history department, uh, it's a very well-established expectation, a formalized expectation, that faculty who are teaching lower division classes allocate a specific amount of time per week to work with graduate student instructors or TAs on classroom teaching. That expectation does not apply at the upper division uh, level. It applies only at the lower division level. And then at the lower division level, faculty actually receive specific uh, you know, credit in our uh, calculation of uh, you know, various kinds of service for the work that they do with GSIs. So we do try to sort of institutionalize uh, this uh, apprentice-like uh, model of, of training and teaching. Mm -hmm. And when it works in practice, it's supposed to in theory, with graduate students teaching first at the lower division before they teach at the upper division, then I think it works very well. Um, probably it works even better than the university-mandated course on uh, teaching that I was responsible for this, uh, this semester. Of course, it doesn't always work like that in practice, because Haley, you were teaching for the first time at Berkeley uh, this fall, and you taught an upper division class. Well, I actually taught a lower division oh, class, but my professor did have a, like a real problem that he couldn't come into the class. But he did give me <laughs> weekly, and we had seven GSIs, so we had weekly kind of instructions of what to do in the classroom as well. Okay, so, so look, in, in practice, of course, experiences vary, but in theory, this is, this is how it works. <laughs> 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 I mean, from my perspective, the, the striking thing is not just the difficulty in getting uh, professors to visit the classrooms of their teaching assistants. Uh, it's, that's just a subset of a larger problem, which, which Laura alluded to, is that people don't go into other people's classrooms. And in fact, it's kind of indecorous to go into someone's, uh, someone else's classroom, and it's like standing over someone's shoulder while they're writing an essay. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and so it's, it's a punishment, right? It's, it happens when something's going wrong. That's when someone comes in and you know, makes you totally nervous uh, and, and watches you teach. So um, I've tried a little bit to just go to my colleagues' lectures just to see how they do it. Um, and again, I am shocked at the diversity. Not, not diversity of excellence, but just diversity of what the general project is. And I think one of the things that uh, maintains this sort of we do research and teaching happens on the side is that we don't have ways to talk to each other about how we're teaching. We're often very confused about how each other is teaching, partly because we have no idea what the other, we have all these mechanisms for reviewing each other's research, <laughs> tenure, all that kind of thing. Uh, that just, there's nothing like that at the, at the level of teaching, which is a, an enormous part of our job. Uh, yeah. I was just saying, I mean, one of the things that we have done is we've, we have been trying to improve our graduate instruction uh, in a variety of different ways. And uh, so one of the things that I've been fairly insistent on is the importance of thinking about assessment and in some sense, mm -hmm. what is it that we want our students to do the, the, across the range? And how are we actually assessing that they're getting it, right? Uh, and, and so as I teach them that idea or as we discuss that idea, I also talk about our own classroom experience as teachers as something that we need to assess, right? And so I try to build it for them. I mean, because it is, it's, it's scary. I mean, they all put up with it, um, have, you know, being observed because they feel like they have to. But I think, uh, to some extent, most would probably prefer never to have a member in the room with them uh, while they're teaching. But I think thinking of it as um, asking, what is it that I'm trying to do, and how do I get better at it? Um, and am I doing what I'm hoping or claiming to do? I think it's been helpful for them in thinking about having faculty uh, or others in the room uh, one day next year. And, and, and so one of the things is I think it needs to be more than once, um, which is hard, right? Like almost everything in terms of assessment. You, you assign an essay and then they never have a chance to improve upon or, or take your comments or, or understand what they did well and what they didn't and then do another essay. Uh, it's a lost opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but that's hard and it takes a lot of buy-in also from faculty uh, to, to get that to happen. Yeah, I, 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 
first time I've taken a workshop uh, uh, in the Division Department of Oakland College when I'm recently from the University of Michigan. So similar institution, GSI. Okay. But I just want to say this, this point that you made a couple of times about um, having this big conversation and, and talking about and seeing the diversity and, and how people feel about what they do and what they do. I think that's really important. Um, because otherwise, all these other things, these, these, these being observed, and having this other conversation, it really just does become teaching on the side, right? It becomes sort of teaching like at, at a general level, which is also really important. I mean, I agree with the sentiment. My own, my own background is interdisciplinary, and I, I think it's really important to be talking to people how, other than historians. But if you don't have that conversation, if you don't see, if you can't see how the historians in your department. Um, think about what they do and why it matters and what counts as history and historical thinking, then all of these other things, I mean, what are they really addressing? They're, they're, they're addressing, again, sort of good practice or, or, or good practice in a general sense. So it's a conversation that you brought up a couple of times. And I'm very moved by it. I think, I think that that's, that's really important to have that conversation at an institutional level, local department. Hi, uh, I'm Taylor, uh, grad student at Catholic University. Um, our department is very small have a historical teaching class that is required, but it's only offered every other year. So I was fortunate enough to take it when I first started TA. But obviously, then there are some people who don't take it until perhaps the third semester of, of TA. Um, and it's a great course, and it was very helpful. Um, but I look back, that was three years ago. And, you know, my own thoughts of teaching have changed a lot. I've taught now a few classes of my own. Um, and I was just thinking, uh, in regards to the Berkeley program, so what sort of tracking takes place? Obviously, there are course evaluations, but you know, you're an advanced graduate student. Things have changed from when you start off teaching to year six. Um, you know, are there conversations with your department chair or your graduate advisor that take place? Um, and then my other question is about maintenance. Um, and you know, what sort of thinking about the Berkeley class, which sounds great. But what sort of things do we do for third year graduate teachers who now are going to be thinking much differently because now they actually understand what it means to decide an assignment that works and to grade and not to decide, you know, another reasonable about the how to run the discussion. So how do you kind of keep up uh, your routine? At Berkeley, it may be the graduate students themselves who are helping to answer this question. We have some advanced graduate students who've taken it upon themselves to create a working group uh, on learning and teaching. And so they really want to get this question going and engaging with faculty members. But this uh, is also a question that um, those of us who are thinking about other more institutionalized possibilities moving forward, or, or not so much informal workshops, but other venues for more advanced students to further develop their teaching to address some of the questions that maybe aren't able to be addressed fully in the mandated course. Uh, so this is an ongoing conversation, but uh, and, and as is the conversation around creating this working group, um, and I'm not sure that that, uh, that particular group of students has yet formalized their program. I don't know, Daniel, if you have any updates. But certainly it's, it's in the works at Berkeley, and I'm sure other institutions too, where this exactly the question you're talking about is sort of, well, how do you move forward in time with graduate students who are in different places, um, maybe those who are thinking about uh, you know, going on the market and preparing themselves dealing with the professional development as teachers that needs to happen later on, or dealing with the pedagogical questions that come up as they teach their own classes, which is a, a possibility uh, at Berkeley as at some other universities as well. So one answer then, at Berkeley anyway, is that um, it's kind of come uh, from the graduate students themselves. And another is this is you know, a question that's um, out to all of us, which is what do we at Berkeley and elsewhere do to continue to support graduate students after their first uh, semester teachings behind them. Yeah, Indiana University has a similar graduate um, group that, that meets regularly. And the goal for that group is to produce something for their teaching portfolio. So it's a kind of intermediary that's students driven, but is designed around a purpose of professional development for the job market. Mm -hmm. So I, if David Pace were here, he had, he had hoped to be here, he, he could say more about that. But I don't know if that would be. I would just add that 
I think that this is a great opportunity for sort of older cohorts of grad students to connect with first, second, third years and share. So not only have faculty sharing their experiences, but to provide these advanced grad students with a way to get to know their younger peers and share you know, the many experiences that they've already had. I know that the English department at Stanford does this, so they have like a group of more advanced grad students who work with um, running workshops and things like that for their, for their younger students. And um, yeah, I think just drawing on those resources Um, could you talk a little bit more practically speaking about how you work together as instructor and grad student both at Berkeley and at Northwestern? What what roles do each of you have to contribute to shaping this seminar? Sure, in, in creating this particular yeah. course. Um, so both Daniel and I were involved in the AHA delegation meeting in which we talked a lot about uh, SOTL, but also how to apply SOTL, um, both the big picture and then concrete uh, questions. And then both Daniel and I um, were involved in the other seminar I mentioned, which was, uh, and this goes to the question of sort of cross-disciplinary pedagogy, research, and, and how that's useful, we're involved in, in that as well. Uh, my job was really to try to take all of those comments um, at our various meetings, look at the research itself, and try to put together the syllabus, the actual physical syllabus, with that. And so then Daniel and I worked very closely together, having multiple conversations of, well, how do we actually do this? Again, meeting the institutional requirements, thinking about where our graduate students are at that moment, um, and uh, trying to pull in some of the insights from the research while realizing that at the stage that our students are taking the course, they, they don't have the time to read a ton of the research themselves at that moment. So how can we plug them into this world of research and resources? Uh, and how can we also support them in their day-to-day -day teaching and preparation? Um, so that was a lot of our conversation was revising and revising and, and, and thinking through these questions and also continuing to go back and forth uh, with the AHA delegation about specific uh, bibliography, activities, resources, and this goes to, to Laura's point about the utility of a future resource that we don't yet have which would continue to distill some of the insights from SOTL and other areas of research for uh, concrete usage tomorrow, you know, that kind of thing. And that's one thing that I think we came to in our, in our back and forth mm -hmm. after the AHA delegation meeting. And then Daniel was the instructor um, of the course. This is I simply talk about this. I think I had students on a, on a week to week uh, basis. Um, I, I should say this is probably a good opportunity to say, I mean, if our syllabus is, would, would be useful for anybody to look at, yeah. I'm very glad to share that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to commend it as any kind of model. And I would want to emphasize the constraints uh, within which we work, uh, namely that this is a required class mandated by the university. Uh, what we did, or rather, you know, what Lindsay did to tell the story more accurately, uh, was in essence very simple. We took the syllabus which had existed, had been taught in the, in the past. It had, uh, in previous versions, uh, you know, sort of dealt with uh, a variety of practical classroom issues in that one was over the course of an entire semester. I felt that that was you know, far too long uh, to be talking about you know, such practical issues as sort of grading or uh, you know, propriety of conduct in the classroom and that kind of thing. So we did the uh, you know, traditional uh, material what had in the past constituted this class and just compressed it uh, in time so that it only took a third of the semester. And then we devoted about a third of the semester to engagement with the social uh, literature. And the last third of the semester, we devoted to a sort of you know, department-wide uh, conversation uh, that this sort of elusive quandary, which we've been uh, talking about today, and that was broadly uh, sort of how we how we reformulated the class. You know, as I stress, uh, this was an improvised solution, improvised within you know, specific uh, constraints. But you know, if the experience is useful to anybody in the syllabus, might be interested about that, then we're very glad to share it. So, I don't know, Julia, do we have the syllabus on the Asia's website, or is there any, you know? 
I don't recall having received the final version of it, but it's possible that I did back in the summer. Uh, we have on the community site um, a teaching and learning community, and my hope is that some of this conversation can continue there. And certainly, uh, it would be helpful, um, Lindsay, if you can would be willing to post to some of this. And also, if you guys have a program for your workshops at Northwestern to begin sort of sharing models for how to think about these things. Well, our syllabus you can certainly have. I mean, you should get it on California Street of Information. <laughs> <laughs> you can also just give me your email address at the end, and we'll provide them. But that'll be great, Julia, to put all of those resources in one place. I know we've talked about that in the past. I'll research that. Yeah, our process was, was pretty similar. I think that we spent a lot of the summer back and forth revising the syllabus. Um, we had meetings also with the Center for Teaching and Learning on campus and with the Graduate School. Um, and the Teaching and Learning Center was really helpful in giving us to, they really pushed us to clarify what our objectives were for the program um, and what deliverables we were going to have, right? Like what assessments our graduate students were going to produce and how we could count them as successful or not. So those turned out to be teaching philosophy, um, a syllabus for an intro level course in their field, a syllabus for an upper level seminar, and then a teaching portfolio at the end, so they are going to stack. But, um, and then as far as feedback on those materials go, like Daniel and I both read them and we each provide comments based on a you know, rubric that we develop for the, for the assessments and that kind of thing. So that's how our sort of our day to day roles work out. Uh, there's also one thing that we do which I think is working out very well, which is that Rebecca leads all the discussions. So we have 30 people in the room, Rebecca chairs and very actively leads the discussion. And that's not only great because she's very good at leading discussion, but it's also good because um, she has access to the graduate students as members of a community in the way that I will never have. Uh, so I think it's gone a long way toward building, at least among the graduate students, a community of people who are talking about this in a room, you know, Twice, twice a month, but also talking about it in the halls, and Rebecca will also say, oh, Austin, you and I had this conversation about this over beers, now I'm bringing it into the room. So that, I think that actually helps quite a lot in, in endowing these with a sense of not just like this is the faculty coming to tell the graduate student what's what, but a group of people at various ranks all kind of collectively mulling over as I think. We had a session like that last year, not at our ongoing workshop, but a one-time deal on student writing and how to teach student writing, which is one of, I think, our biggest challenges um, in the field uh, with regard to undergraduates. And it was faculty and students, so that was great, and graduate students and faculty, that was great, but it quickly sort of degenerated into this complaint. It was just like, it was just a bitch session about how bad student writing is. Um, and very little, a lot, I think a lot of people who wanted a more constructive discussion felt that we had nothing to go on. Like, like what's the thing that we're building on that, you know, who has expertise? No one has expertise. People say, I do it this way, and the student writing sucks. Well, I do it this way, and it still sucks. You know, so that's what <laughs> went around the room, and that's what you came up with. And, um, and so no one seemed to be able to, in other words, there was no one there with any real expertise except they themselves could write but that didn't make them any expertise on how any, give them any expertise on how to teach someone else how to write. And it, it's exactly that feeling that drove me to this, my interest in this field. Um, it, it, it's exactly that, you know, that, that there are people who are systematically looking at these things that maybe in, in total what they have to say has to be modified for my particular context, but there are, I think, growing communities that are, are trying to explore um, and provide faculty with some place to go. Um, so somebody or some group of faculty and or students has to take, has to become you and you and you and say, all right, this is, because it's not going to spontaneously generate necessarily among, I mean, there's a lot of, I think people have mentioned, there's a lot of skepticism among my colleagues that this is something worth doing. You're really, you're there as a graduate student to become a scholar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is all, all the rest of it's kind of, you know, window dressing or something, and it might help you get a job, but that's not what you're primarily here for. So what it requires is someone to step outside of that box and to learn that, that literature and to have some kind of expertise. And that's, 
you know, for some department, we have to follow order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or at, at least I think in the the context of the graduate programs that we're talking about, introducing graduate students to the fact that this does exist and uh, knowing where to go for help, then planting the seeds that we can inquire into our own teaching, I think is sort of a key habit of mind that, um, and, and having the tools accessible, I, I think are, are really, yeah, it, it, it's a culture shift. Mm -hmm. And you're, I think you're absolutely right. We um, are swimming against the stream of, of many places and, and colleagues. I think too, like a lot of times I feel like my role, and I, mean, I don't know if Daniel feels this way too, but is like kind of a translator between the civil community yeah. on campus. Because I, I did a sort of graduate student training program through the Teaching and Learning Center. Um, so that, you know, one foot in there and then another foot in, you know, I have like a history brain, I think like a historian, uh, and feeling like, right, you can kind of translate between these two communities who oftentimes are not necessarily disagreeing with each other, but are using different language or might have not articulated assumptions in the same way. Um, and I think also having an enormous amount of, of empathy for people in both camps um, goes a long way also because nobody likes to hear that you know, this other group of people is talking about teaching in a way and you're doing it wrong. So, um, so right, just kind of trying to, trying to be patient as people are confronting different ways of thinking about the things that they've thought about before. I feel like it's made the, it, right, it feels like a conversation more than a, more than a conflict sometimes. I wonder if I could respond to the point from a slightly different uh, vantage uh, temporarily, which is that of a faculty member who teaches graduate students. I think that from a sort of advantage of uh, teaching graduate students how to do good research, and even more important, teaching graduate students how to do good analytical history writing, there's actually a real value uh, in, in this kind of class. Uh, because, uh, you, you know, at least in, in my limited experiences, one of the challenges uh, advising uh, dissertation work is that graduate students get stuck into the empirical material and they forget the writing history is, in essence, uh, doing analysis and interpretation of the past. You know, they fixate upon the excavation of empirical material from the archives, and they you know, lose sight of the large uh, you know, need to analyze, uh, interpret, and make sense of that material. And I think one of the you know, real uh, dividends of a class of this nature, or a seminar of this nature, focusing on teaching for graduate students as researchers, is it reminds them that historical explanation is in and of itself a form of teaching. Mm -hmm. That there's a need for you know the kind of meta narration that we do in the classroom in our uh, writing as historians too. Mm -hmm. So you know I tried in this class to sort of blur uh, the distinction, uh, the categorical distinction that often exists and gets repeated uh, between teaching and research. And, and I thought that doing so was valuable. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I was working with sort of early career graduate students who aren't yet stuck into the gritty detail of, of doing dissertation research. Uh, but I don't know, Lindsay, whether you have any perspective. On, on, on that point from your advantage as a more sort of advanced career uh, graduate student. Oh, definitely, because I mean, certainly being, pay, spending so much time with the documents themselves, uh, no matter how you're reading them, how well you're reading them, you can certainly lose sight of the fact that you are uh, acting as a teacher in a lot of ways in terms of creating a final product that people who haven't looked at those documents uh, are gonna find relevant to them, and so finding that kind of, uh, I suppose, synergy between uh, the research activity and teaching, which I know was explored in the course, but illustrating that and having students experience the benefits of seeing that, uh, I think would be fantastic, and certainly ideas to make that, make that happen. You're welcome. So I would enthusiastically endorse that, the connection between the two, but I think that it's sometimes hard for us to see, in part because people whether they're of the subtle variety or not, who think really carefully and care a lot about teaching, tend to emphasize discussions and denigrate lecturing. And I think that if that is done so much, first of all, we alienate a lot of our colleagues for whom lecturing is the necessary way of imparting information. But also, the, I think it's in the, in the lecture that the line, the relationship between yeah. writing, research, and teaching becomes more clear. Um, and I noticed that when we're talking to our graduate students, one, I mean, there's, you know, differences that, you know, with, with rank comes experience and all that kind of thing, but 
the graduate students really think of the central part of teaching as being the discussion section, because that's the part that they do. Uh, and so, like, we started talking about that, and they're all like, oh, yeah, we should just abolish the lecture. <laughs> like, it's all discussion section. And we had some really interesting discussions between the faculty and the graduate students about the role of lecture, which is, I think, also connected to this, whether, whether the graduate students see their lecturing or their potential lecturing, their future lecturing, as, as related to their, uh, to their writing. And that's something in Eau Claire that you had mentioned in terms of your experience in the class. Yeah, um, 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 yeah, it was, wait, okay, <laughs> sorry, um, it was definitely, um, because I, I come in thinking that teaching and much, and teaching and writing history were very different. I come in sort of, sort of assuming that teaching, whether it be, I didn't really know what discussion section was for. I didn't have them as an undergraduate, um, and I did my master's in a European system that was very different. Um, so I didn't really know what these discussion sections were for, and so I really thought that in undergraduate teaching it was imparting a narrative, maybe tweaking the narrative to make it more appropriate to today's values than maybe a high school narrative that's backdated 50 years. But, um, and I thought that it was at the graduate level and the level of, uh, you know, post-dissertation research as well that people were unpacking narratives and reconstructing them and things like that. So it seemed very interesting to me that some of the core things that we're teaching the undergraduates, even in a discussion section, you um, lower division, is to unpack the arguments, both of the um, primary source materials and the textbooks and the monographs, if they have monographs, and um, teach them to build their own arguments with evidence. And I thought that was, you know, we were talking about historical thinking. Um, and I think that for me, a lot of that was about context and making sure that the students understood that they needed, that they needed context for their arguments. And they couldn't just give their opinion without any context or without any reference to the texts that that, that, that didn't stand alone. So for me, it felt, that learning these things, even though perhaps they're more in line with lectures that we haven't done yet, it seemed that I was learning how to put into practice practices I learned as a student in graduate seminars in terms of unpacking arguments and reconstructing them. Perhaps an extension of the topic, but again, I'm Jessica Sandru from Carnegie Mellon. Um, one of the things I did a lot of work with was working with graduate student instructors on how to teach students with special needs in the college classroom. And um, I'm wondering if that's something you guys addressed at all in your um, workshops or in your course, because it, at least from my perspective, the number of students coming into college with various the gamut of issues is increasing by the minute. Um, the most prevalent one in our case happened to be um, non-native speakers mm -hmm. who had varying, but widely varying degrees of fluency. Um, but we also had every other potential medical, mental, social issue you could imagine. Um, and it was my job as head TA to actually coordinate all of their accommodations. So that was an interesting adventure. But I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on how you approach that with incoming graduate instructors. We have, so in our AHA uh, delegation meeting, one thing that, that we did discuss was this idea of, of access to um, the material, to the class, to, the, to education, uh, and 
that certainly goes to uh, English language learners. It goes to uh, very different secondary school backgrounds that, that we certainly see in a, a big public education. Um, we also, for um, people with different learning needs or physical needs, we have um, an office that handles accommodations, and that goes through the professor uh, in particular classes. So obviously there are a lot of different issues that, that come out of your comment. Um, in this big university, we also have centers that are dedicated to some of these issues, a writing center. Uh, and they can oftentimes, in my experience, be overwhelmed by the number of students who need that kind of assistance. If you look at our uh, GSI handbook that's put together by the GSI Teaching and Resource Center, which is extremely helpful and actually does uh, distill a lot of the general pedagogy research on things like commenting on writings and, and things that I find very uh, concrete and, and practical and are, are part of the uh, syllabus, you'll see. Um, but that problem of uh, especially people who need help with writing, I certainly don't think we have solved it and it is a much bigger university issue because the GSI isn't expected, and this is expressed in that GSI handbook, isn't expected to be able to uh, fill in a lot of the the gaps. Some university resources are listed um, and some techniques are given in terms of, well, how do you respond to a paper where someone is learning how to write in English? What's useful, what's not? What can you do in your particular role and how can you hook the student up to resources? But the fact is that I, I feel that those resources are still very much um, in need. Uh, Daniel, in, in sure, they could add a few words. I think one of the tensions that I felt when, when engaging with this issue as the instructor of Berkeley's uh, pedagogy uh, class was a sort of tension uh, between the needs of the undergraduates and the needs of the graduate students. And I suppose I was inclined to, uh, you know, take seriously the needs of the graduate students because of my role uh, in, in, in relation to this course. Because the fact is that our graduate students don't get jobs on the strength of their performance as graduate student instructors. They get jobs on the strength of their designations. We don't pay them a whole lot of money for work that they do as graduate and student instructors. Thus, I think it's very difficult uh, to ask more and more and more after our graduate students. You know, more commentary on student papers, more time outside of the classroom with the undergraduates with whom uh, they're, they're teaching and so on and so forth. So one of the priorities that I had for this class was to work with the graduate students to help them think about ways in which they could uh, provide assistance in an efficient and targeted way to the undergraduate students who needed it the most. So I did not encourage graduate students uh, to provide the sort of copious and comprehensive written comments on student papers across the board. I said, you know, much better to save that comments for the students who really need the most. So trying to develop uh, these conversations with undergraduates who are having particular you know, difficulties rather than uh, overextend yourselves and taking away time from your research yeah. in order to give um, you know, extensive written commentary that may or may not be uh, you know, devoured and internalized and consumed <laughs> by the intended beneficiaries. <laughs> and you know, there are different ways of doing this, but I think that it's a tension that any course of this nature is going to have to confront. Because ultimately, our graduate students are our students too. You know, they have needs and interests which are every bit as valid and important uh, as those of the undergraduates who uh, they are tasked with. I think I think that we um, made some headway in raising awareness in our participants um, about the sort of like diverse backgrounds of students, and we talked about some ways to to write, gather that information. But then we got to the point of conversation about like, well, what do you do once you know that they come with different knowledge bases and different backgrounds than even our most seasoned instructors in the room are kind of like, well, oh, we're still trying to figure that out. So um, I would say that's where, where that's where we made some progress, but still won't know what the answers are. I think um, one, we did speak about this briefly, at least in the class, um, several times, and I think it was important to keep in mind that we would be designing our assignments and our rubrics based on specific goals that we think our students would be able of accomplishing and also kind of reinforcing those goals. And I think that that was helpful for me in terms of 
thinking about how I would be approaching the assignment and grading it um, for the skills that I really want the students to have and not skills that maybe some people don't have and I wouldn't be teaching. So basically kind of targeting both teaching and, and assessment. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, Laura, if you could respond to the issue of um, teaching graduate students about special needs because of your, your teacher candidate training. Oh my, yeah, I, I have a lot of experience in thinking through this issue. Um, so I, one of the things that I do at, at my institution is work with uh, social studies certification students and about half of our majors are teacher candidates. So this is a, an issue that is, looms large on their minds. And also at the kind of institution where we are, a, a public, um, institution that serves the the needs of a, of a very diverse urban area we have a lot of students um, increasing numbers of students who are coming uh, with a range of issues and, and I've become more attentive to it as well I have a son on the autism spectrum and the um, this issue of what we're looking for what we're assessing and and access um, is something I've th I've been thinking a lot about in talking with students. You know, does re do reading challenges with which many of our students come with many of our students, and is probably the biggest challenge I hear to using primary sources K twelve even at the college level in introductory courses. Our students aren't able to to read them. Um, this issue of um, of access to reading uh, is, is one I sort of put back and say, how can we find primary sources, use primary sources to foster the kinds of thinking that we, we want to foster in terms of deconstructing texts, understanding sort of deeper meanings of text when language is an issue. So I don't have a good answer to this, but it, it is a problem, I think, that uh, if it is not something that graduate students do, can you know, do immediately in the courses in, in which they're assigned, they may well have to confront. And the way the population of our institution is moving is something that, that you will confront in your, your first year of teaching. So those resources, I think, are um, they're available on all campuses, but I think as maybe as a profession, you know, what what can we offer our students who struggle to access a regular curriculum is is the more important question. You know, so what what can we do to help them either move along in their literacy skills or um, take the kinds of skills that we're trying to target and address them for the students that are in our particular classrooms. Um, I, I don't have a good answer to that. I have a lot of problems I've seen, but I'm afraid there's, it, it's not something that we're talking about, I think, at ev any level of history education. Just a, a practical comment to your mm -hmm. response there. Um, I'm a 20th century African Americanist, but I come by way of a K-12 educator before mm -hmm. coming into graduate school. And one of the exercises that I did with my um, 20th century U.S. class that actually worked out very, very well, um, I found a, a book that was compiled from oral histories from the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. And it actually came with a CD. So I was trying to think of how to incorporate different types mm -hmm. of texts in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So I was able to use the oral interviews in, on audio mm -hmm. while the kids read along from the book. Mm -hmm. And for those especially that were having reading issues, they were able to kind of use two input methods at once, you mm -hmm. know, to try to get a handle on it. And I actually got very good reviews on that. Um, people commented specifically on that section because they were able to really hear the voice of the person that was involved, to hear the inflection, and I, I use photographs and material culture and other uh, just other ways of helping people get their hands on history, mm -hmm. literally. And I think sometimes the hierarchy that we impose between high school and college mm -hmm. 
causes more problems than it helps because the K-12 educators out there are doing hard and amazing and brilliant work. And if you can kind of reach across the aisle, so to speak, they have a wealth of resources sometimes. Mm -hmm. So just as a, mm -hmm. as a comment for, you know, mm -hmm. open consumption there, that's yeah. definitely something to consider. Yeah, I, I have this idea, and maybe some in the room will take this up, that, you know, it's sort of creating accessible sources for the classroom. I mean, I, I think there's a huge need for it at all levels, and to do those kinds of things. Um, you know, targeted with specific skills, um, the kinds of things that you're talking about, identifying what exactly you really want students to do. I mean, it cuts down on grading time as well. So it, it, it serves a lot of very practical <laughs> issues. I do have one related comment. Um, I've been going to these sessions with secondary teachers on student writing, and it's very helpful because secondary teachers have much more experience than I do, and they are they really know um, a lot of different strategies. So it's been a very productive exercise for me, and I think it could be productive for more academic historians too. I'll, I'll put in a plug for our colleague, um, Chauncey Montesano, who's um, published in Perspectives and um, was a student of Sam Weinberg's, is now at the University of Michigan. I was recently talking with her. She's doing a historical writing project. So she's looking at stages of historical writing across elementary through college writing so I'm and, and and historical writing as well so she'll be working with historians about their writing so I'm really excited to hear more about what comes out of that project about how students develop these writing skills because that's that's like my current problem in my classes that I'm trying to get better at is is teaching writing so there's a that's another I mean, huge need and, and I hope will soon be some resources for us Okay, well, thank you all so much for a lively conversation. Um, thanks to the panel, and enjoy the rest of your AHA.